All right, folks, welcome to this 4th of July edition, weekend edition of Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. I wish I had like a fireworks uh, sound effect here, but <laughs> it's always but you know, it's illegal. Yeah, you know it's illegal here if you live in the state of Illinois, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Even though I keep hearing them every other night. Oh, yeah, I'm about to say we've been hearing them for about a month here, so. <laughs> right, so. Uh, I am Sydney Brown, a.k.a. Sid the Kill, along with my co-host, co-founder, and Miss Everything creator of Sega City Sports, Miss Lakina McGee. Hi, Lakina, how are you? That's the first I've ever heard the word creative next to my name, so this is this is a, this is a fir first for me. <laughs> I'm doing well, Sid. You can follow me at Kina McGee on Twitter and Kina under underscore McGee on the Insta. Mm, excuse me. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at SidKid80. Once again, it's at SidKid80, S-I-D-K-I-D-80. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-80. Join us today for our special broadcast as veteran sports writer and veteran sports talk show host, formerly a 670 scorer, in front of the show, we welcome Miss Maggie Hendricks. Maggie, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Happy to be talking with you guys. Same here. Yeah. yeah. And where can people find you on social media? I am at Maggie Hendricks, and it's M-A-G-G-I-E-H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S. And that's on Twitter, Instagram, pretty much everything. All right. Nice. Let's get to our top story for this week's edition of our podcast. Baseball has returned. It is going to have a 60-game schedule as we are recording this podcast for this weekend. Both the Cubs and the White Sox are practicing at their both respective stadiums at Wrigley Field for the Cubs and at that corporate name, which I will not name for the Chicago White Sox. <laughs> <laughs> they are practicing down on the south side. Maggie, before we get to the nuts and bolts of this deal, um, what were your feelings about how the negotiations went between the players and the owners? Are you happy that the game of baseball is back? I mean, kind of, but I also, when I hear things like how bad it's spiking in Florida and Arizona and Texas, and there are so many teams in those three states, it, it concerns me. And it just makes me feel like I, I don't know if we deserve baseball yet. I don't know if we deserve, we haven't done the work as a country to beat this disease. So do we deserve to see these sports play just yet? I, I don't know. I mean, if, if the players feel comfortable and confident, great. But I feel like if there, there is one outbreak, if there's one team gets it, everything is so close, everybody's gonna get it. And it just, we don't know the long-term effects of these disease, of this coronavirus. There's so much we don't know that just like jumping in and being like, yeah, oh, so baseball, we're just going to play. Feels really, really worrisome. Yeah. I was just watching Sports Center and they were interviewing, well, they played a clip from Mike Trout's uh, Zoom uh, conference. Uh, he, he was interviewed by reporters earlier today. And he was expressing his concerns about the player safety as well. Of course, you know, he's been one of the players on the front lines uh, expressing concerns about how are, are the players going to go through this? Will they be safe as safe as possible How are they going to combat this of course we all know that him and his wife are expecting a baby within any moment now so uh i, I can understand coming from mike trout's uh, standpoint many not me personal but many of us as fan, fans expect players just to perform and, and perform like robots and they're human beings too after they take out the uniform so i can see where players like him are are, are where they are coming from we have to be mindful of that yeah, exactly. There's so, and the thing is, is like some of the issues that make you predisposed to being having more of a problem with coronavirus aren't necessarily going to keep you off the field. If you have asthma, like I do, you're more likely to have problems with it. If you have diabetes, like a whole lot of athletes do, you're more likely to have it. And like when we start thinking about when we start getting into football and that sort of thing, Offensive linemen are generally overweight because that's kind of, that's what they have to be for their job. Mm -hmm. Obesity is a problem when you have coronavirus. So like there's, there's just so many issues that I feel like haven't been thought through without like, without, with a doctor, with like epidemiologists saying like, yes, this is okay. When I see epidemiologists saying, yes, then we should play, be playing baseball, then I'll be comfortable with it. But right now, the good thing I see coming from it is that the players, and I'm not just talking about baseball players, I'm talking about all athletes right now, 
are using their voice in a way they never ever have. So seeing Mike Trout, who generally is pretty, pretty quiet, pretty just laid back yeah. guy, mm -hmm. him say, you know what, this may not be safe. And I don't see why I should play a 60 game season when I could end up getting my wife who is carrying our child, him using his voice and other players using their voice is something I, I'm really happy about. I hate that it had to come to this, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the other thing to think about is C, the CBA ends at the end of this year. So, and players and owners are not exactly in a good place. So I'm interested to see how all of this plays out and how it affects those negotiations. It'll be interesting, though, because like you said, Maggie, you've mentioned all the players that have like various health health issues, health concerns. I mean, and Anthony Rizzo is a cancer survivor. So you got to think he's going to be, you know, he's got to be very careful as well, though he has lost a lot of weight. So but that, that not totally not really. But that that's you know, that's something you got to worry about as well. Do you think that because your buster only said that from ESPN say that, well, I he gives them like a five percent chance that they'll be able to finish this season. What do you think the chances are that they'll, they'll be able to do this? I, I don't think there's going to be. I don't think I don't think maybe we might get like a week or two of baseball. But I, I think the fact that we're already getting positive tests, the fact that we're already hearing things. The good thing about baseball is that it's outside. So like basketball, I'm much more concerned about because it's outside trans, transmission rates are low. But players don't always only – you know, get ready for the games outside. It's not like the locker rooms outside. It's not like there are batting cages outside. All of these things that they have to go through, there's still plenty of places for them to, to transmit. And so, you know, I, I hope, I hope everybody follows the protocols perfectly. A season happening and there being no infections and everybody healthy. What, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing we need right now. But I just feel like every game I'll be watching, there'll also be a little bit of anxiety underneath it. I want to go back to the uh, to baseball for a minute, Maggie. And you talked about the the relationship between the owners and the players. Of course, there was posturing going on back and forth, and we said on this program for the last several weeks until uh, until the, the the sixty game schedule was announced. Now, both the players and the owners were fighting like five year old kids. You know, stop fighting in the public, handle your stuff behind closed doors. And I think, it, especially if they would not have played this season, it would have been an ugly setup for next year because, as you mentioned, that the, new, that the CBA ends after 2021. I still, even though you're going to have a sprint to the season with the 60-game schedule, this could get ugly in terms of, of the new negotiations for the CBA um, following, which expires at the end of next year. I, I think it's, it could get ugly before it gets better. Right. I, I, don't, I don't see how players playing in a dangerous situation is going to – there's no real way to improve on that. You know, like it, unless the owners make all kinds of concessions when, the new, when it's time for the next CBA thing, there's not a lot of ways to, for a player who is sitting across that negotiating table, they're not going to forget how the owners acted and how the owners wanted to push all the losses onto the players. And they're, they're not going to forget that. They're not dumb. So, like, that, I think that they, the owners made mistakes. I think the owners made much more mistakes than the players did as far as being long-term and thinking about, like, how can we set up to make sure that there won't be a work stoppage next after next season? I don't think they've done a very good – the owners haven't done a very good job of thinking – long term about this because these players aren't going to forget and and also the, you know, the fans aspect of it you know you got some I think they say that over at Wrigley Field it could get maybe up to 25 percent I don't know what the maybe that much over a guarantee rate field but then you have other other stadiums and other states that say they may not be able to let people in at all California's closing up again Arizona's closing up so do you think what about sort of like the fans aspect of it do you think there's going to be anyone that going to be anybody in the, in the stands at all with for these games you know a week ago I would have been like no there's nobody stupid enough to, to go do that but then of course Wrigleyville was packed last weekend with you know people drinking and being idiots and there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing people love doing more in Wrigleyville and, and I mean I live in uptown I'm just 
one neighborhood north of that, but there's nothing people love doing more than drinking and being dumb in, in Wrigleyville. So here's what I'm hoping. Um, as far as everything with the pandemic is going, Lori Lightfoot, I think has been doing a very good job. There are other ways I do not think she is, but that's probably another podcast. Um, <laughs> but I really, I, I think that, I don't think she's, she's going to allow fans this season. I don't think that's going to happen because like there, there's just not enough upside to it because if you have fans, then you have to have people working concessions. You have to have ushers. You have, have to have all kinds of things, even at 25% capacity. And Wrigley, lucky enough, is, is an easy one to figure out what 25% is because it's around 40,000 is their max capacity. So about 10,000 fans at Wrigley. How, much, how many more staff do you need for 10,000 fans? How many, like, what does 10,000 fans mean beyond that 10,000? And I think that those numbers and whatever the heck's going to happen in Chicago in the next month or two is going to dictate, is going to be too much. It's just going to be too much. As we said on this, uh, on this program last week, uh, Maggie and Lakina, that if there's no uniformity as far as uh, how many fans you should be let in, in the stands, uh, there should be no fans at all across the board. Because as you mentioned, Lakina, Arizona has to shut down again. So as parts of California, uh, Texas, um, in, in Florida, uh, I know the Texas Rangers are concerned because they had that new ballpark opening up this year. So uh, we know that that's they want some, uh, they don't want to allow fans in. But let's just say like a team like the White Sox, we'll use it as an example. You go to Kansas City, there's no fans. Okay, you go to Detroit, there's no fans. But you go to Texas, you travel, let's just say they travel to Texas in that new ballpark, they have uh, fans at 25% capacity. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's fair. If, you, if they're going, I know states are operating at a different, a different level, but they're on their own. But if, if, if one city is allowed to have fans and, and another city doesn't, I just think that's an unfair advantage there. Yeah, I completely agree with that. You know, the fans, the energy that fans bring means something. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we've been watching the last couple of weeks because there have we have had some sports um, watching the Premier League and in everything over in in Europe, and then of course yeah. watching the NWSL here. They pipe, you know, they pipe in the fan noise and stuff, and they covered the seats. I mean, yes, you notice somewhat, but. I'm sure that at first it's weird for the players, but then they just have to play their game. They, you know, but not being able to draw from that energy shouldn't be, that would be too much of a home field advantage. And, you know, baseball so weird as it is because of how different every park is. So putting that advantage of having fans or not having fans on top of it, I think you're right. That would be unfair. It, it it really will be. We'll get to the we'll get to the aspect with the colleges in a little in a little bit. But uh, second with the so with baseball, uh, which teams do you think will have the base, the big advantages from you know this whole new sort of world that we're going to be playing in that these guys are going to be playing at least for this season? I think East Coast teams are going to get somewhat of an advantage because there are so many East Coast teams and they're so close together that and the way that the schedule is going, that it's kind of clustering and that you're doing interleague with your, with your twin uh, division and that sort, that sort of thing, they are not going to have to travel nearly as far, nearly as much. So when you look at them as opposed to, say, the teams on the West Coast, that they are going to have to go through two time zones, some, some of them three, will have to be playing in Central, Mountain, and West. Um, you know, there's just a lot, there's a lot more difficulties for the teams that are on the West Coast than there are for the ones on the East Coast. So I, I feel like teams like the Yankees and the Red Sox will be able to take advantage of the fact that they don't have to, they basically don't have to work as hard or travel as hard just to play the game. I, and you know what, I think it's, it's going to be a good situation for the White Sox and definitely the White Sox, the Cubs too. I, there's so many unknowns with the Cubs because of having a new manager and everything. But like the White Sox, I think a lot of us were excited to see what they were going to do this season. And so now since they aren't going to have to do as much crazy traveling, I think that's going to help too. 
I want to ask you about the Cubs, Mackie, because they have a former player, now first-year manager, David Roth, and I know they have a lot of decisions to make as far as key players are concerned, are concerned in terms of contracts after this season. This could be their, quote-unquote, last dance. Um, I want to ask you, uh, how do you think that the Cubs will approach this season? Do you think they'll go all in, or, or do you think this will be a, uh, for a lesser of a better term, a throwaway year, We'll see what happens this year because of the 60-game schedule, and we'll, we'll deal with 2021. You know, the 60-game schedule, I feel like it's giving the Cubs an advantage that they wouldn't have had this season in that this 60-game schedule and kind of throwaway year is a, is a time for David Ross to get to know his players as a manager and not as their teammate. Um, but, like, because it's, it's such a short thing, if they get hot two or three times, that's their division. You know, you don't have to, mm -hmm. you don't have to have sustained greatness like you do for a 162 game season. And I feel like the way this team is, if their pitchers get hot and they get a few hot hitters at once, then that could be enough to win the division. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think this, you know, the fact that they have, they only have nothing to lose at this point since it's only 60 games. You know, they kind of just you know, you know, go, you know, go up against the wind and just, you know, be more free flowing. Now, as for the White Sox are concerned, it comes out that Michael Kopech is not going to be with the team at the start of all, start of the spring training or, or whatever, whatever they're calling it. Spring training. <laughs> uh, <yeah>, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but, but also, you know, what do you think, how do you think this will affect the White Sox? You know, I think what the White Sox have going for them is that they, even though they have obviously quite a few young players, they're a tight team who knows each other well. And so the whole, like, you know, that they're not having the full spring training, getting to know each other, getting to know this one's tendency or that one's tendency. And then you throw in a veteran star like Yasmani Grandal to kind of be the veteran presence among all that. And then they still have Jose Abreu to also, to also be that one that everybody knows. I, I, I think it could be a really fun year for the White Sox. I'm really, I mean, here's the thing. I feel like any out of, of all sports, it is really difficult to make any sort of predictions when you don't like, it's not like who's going to go down in injury. It's a much more, you're much more likely to get coronavirus just because you are. And so when you throw that into the mix, it means that we don't know who's not going to be playing all of a sudden. We don't know who, randomly will be put on the on the injured list so I think the teams with the most depth will do the best and right now the White Sox have a lot of depth even without Kopech they still have plenty of pitchers and play, like just everything they've got a little bit of everything so um, I think it's going to be a really exciting year on the south side. Veteran sports talk show host and writer Maggie Hendricks joined us on Sega City Sports Zoom style, along with Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. As we continue to talk baseball, Maggie, I, I, you brought up an interesting point about the White Sox. They have all the young young guys uh, in the depth on paper, and we, me and Lakina, have been talking about over the last couple of weeks that the White Sox are a part of a couple of teams like Arizona, potentially Cincinnati, maybe even Tampa Bay, who we, who returned to the playoffs last year. Any of those young teams can get on a hot streak for the first couple of weeks. That could be the season. They could uh, turn out to be a division championship or, or a wild card. But first, uh, what chances do you give the White Sox realistically to make the playoffs this year with the shortened schedule? Well, the other side of the shortened schedule is that it's going to be expanded playoffs. So with more teams making the playoffs – I mean, they just numerically have a better shot of making it. But like you said, you know, Tim Anderson gets hot and other players will play off of that. And that could be, that could be what gets them into the playoffs. And here's why it's a, it's a great situation, no matter what, for the White Sox just to get in the playoffs. Even if they lose in the first round, even if they get swept out of the first round, playoff experience is so key to winning the next year or the year after that. Mm -hmm. So them getting some sort of playoff experience, some idea what the postseason pressures are like. Shoot, Rick, Ricky Renteria managing in the postseason for the first time in quite some time. All of these things together are exactly what will, what will 
if even if they can't win it all this year, it'll make it so they're in a much better position to win it all next year or the year after that because they're so young, so big. They're just they're sweet little babies. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're, they're, they're they're sweet little babies. Yeah, <laughs> I'll say it. I put that there. I'll market that. Uh, okay. <laughs> so on the flip side, though, with the Cubs having so many veteran players, do you think if this will be sort of the same thing for them? So the thing is, is that the Cubs know how to do this. They know if there's anything that they got very good at under Joe Madden, it's, oh, crap, we're in second place and there's 75 games to go. We better win a whole lot of games. They know how to do this. They can do it. And obviously David Ross has been a part of all of that. So I think if the Cubs can stay focused, stay healthy, Jose Quintana, and do all of these <laughs> things if they can if they can stay focused and healthy and and just kind of stay loose and enjoy playing their games then i think they're in a great great position to to make a run and wouldn't that be fun to have both our chicago teams in the playoffs oh, oh yeah be oh yes that'd be heavenly yeah assuming there are playoffs that's the thing there's just so much up in the air <laughs> That we yeah. don't know, so it's like yeah. I'm gonna get really. I'm gonna be optimistic, but I'm not gonna get my hopes up. You know, right? So yeah. Uh, uh, well, one we all know that baseball uh, cherishes their records like is gold, uh, like is go like it's almost going out of style. Uh, there's been talk about if a, if a player hits 400 this year and, and they played the majority of, of the 60 game schedule, that it should be an asterisk uh, next to it. Of course, with the with this new schedule, uh, I think the home run total. I'm gonna set the uh, under over at 25 and a half. Yeah. I'll ask you first, uh, Maggie. What about uh, a player who hits 400 this year and they plays the majority of the games? Do you think that should have an asterisk to it, or you just say that player earned it and, and they deserved it dis despite the 60 game schedule? I mean, 60 at bat, 60 games. Then you're you're talking about what 240 ish at bats to. Maybe let's say like 220, 225 at bats. If he doesn't, if he does, you know, has to take a couple games off, hitting 400 at in even just 225 at bats is still a hell of a feat. So I think if a, I mean if a player is able to do that, I think we're all going to look back at 2020 with. I think everything about 2020 gets an asterisk next to it because <laughs> everything's insane. But if you can hit 400 over 60 games that's still impressive and asterisks are not a player should still get whatever bonus or whatever whatever would be coming to him if he hit it in a longer season he should still he should still get it because that's it's still an impressive feat what about who who ends up winning it if apparently i'll assume there is like a world series some people are saying that anybody that wins this year they get an asterisk <laughs> who do you think about that I feel like that's somebody who's looking for something negative. You know, if a team winning a, a winning a World Series while there is a pandemic going on, I think they get like not an asterisk, but like stars and hearts over it. Like you know, when you usually <laughs> look for the person you liked in your notebook yep. in high school, right? I feel like everything that they that players have to deal with right now means that they have to go through way more. Yes, it's fewer games, but there's just a hell of a lot more they have to deal with just to get on the field. So, you know, anybody who is like, well, no, that World Series doesn't count. You know what? That's not somebody I want. That's not somebody who I want to sit with at the bar, at an outdoor bar, because that's, <laughs> that's just looking for negativity over a win. And, and I, I'm no thank you. Mm -hmm. And also due to this pandemic that we're going through right now, you know, the one team that benefits from this without having any fans in the stands, without all the criticism from, from the fans, is the Houston Astros. We were all gearing up to, to uh, <laughs> see them, how, how Dusty Baker, now their new manager, see how he was going to manage his players, their, um, their, the ones that, re that remain from that 2017 team, the, how they were going to handle all the pressure from the fans and the media, all the scrutiny day by day. They really get a pass through all this. Not to me, uh, and not to me. People are going to refer to them as cheaters. Uh, as far as they're not going to get the heat as we would have thought they would have uh, would have received if it wasn't for this pandemic. Look, Ryan Braun still gets booed at Wrigley Field. Oh yeah, he 
when it was like four or five seasons ago that he got busted for steroids. I have faith in the ability and the pettiness of baseball fans that we will <laughs> remember whenever we can all be in a stadium again, that we're still going to boo those guys, that we're still going to make sure that they hear it and everything. If, if, if I need to go on a campaign reminding everybody, I will. Because I'm, <laughs> <She's just petty. laughs> I'm petty like that. So, I, you know, I, I feel like they, they're going to think they're going to be off the hook, but it, it, it's coming. Don't worry, guys. It's, it's coming eventually. Oh, I yeah, hope. we'll help you with that I campaign, agree. Maggie. <laughs> oh, I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. Say to the Red Sox, too. I mean, it wasn't as, you know, egregious, but, you know, they, they did, they did get, get punished, and Alice Cora, you know, got let go. So that'll probably – the same thing with that, too. I think that people will remember. Baseball, baseball fans have very long memory, so I don't think there's going to be, like – when we all do come back, you know, go to stadiums, so there's some people are still gonna boo. I don't think I have. I I'm with you, Meg. I have faith in in baseball fans. I do too. Just the faith and I have faith in pettiness. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, that veteran talks radio talk, sports radio talk show host and writer Maggie Hendricks is joining us here on Second State Sports Zoom style. Now let's switch over to the hardwood. Um, we got you know, this tournament that's about to be going, about to kick off in a few weeks down in Florida. Of course, you know, the coronavirus cases are spiking there. But then yesterday it was announced that the last eight teams that didn't make the playoffs, Bulls included, will be playing here for, I guess, I, I don't know, what would you call, I don't know, what what would you call it, Why? I guess? Yeah, I mean, exactly, like, what, the, what, what, exactly, Maggie, Why? I, I saw somebody, I saw uh, Kevin Kadok, who does the, the Midway Minute uh, newsletter. He, he called it the Delete Eight. And I was like, yeah, that's what they're mm. deleting. Yeah, you know? that's interesting. I, I, why? Why in God's name, <laughs> we first of all, need to see, I don't want to see Jim Boylan coach even more pointless games okay. than the ones we were seeing him coach in March. Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, how many unnecessary timeouts is he going to call? Like, no. <laughs> I, I don't understand this at all. I don't think it's, it's necessary or good at all. In one of the downsides of not making the playoffs in any, ever, always, in any sport, is that your team doesn't get the experience of being in the playoffs. So why should these teams who didn't make the playoffs – Get these random games. I understand that the season ended early, but none of these teams were going to be like, oh, if we just get these extra games, we're going to be really great. Like, there's no need to risk their health. There's no need to do any of this. It's an indoor game, and indoor games are more dangerous than outdoor games. So just no. There's just no need for it. <laughs> and I, I, I just do not understand it. And I am hoping that the players exercise their voices and the Players Association, which of course the and National Basketball Players Association is pretty strong, that they say this is insane and it's dangerous for us and you're making us, you know, even if they, yeah, like they said, they wanted to do it in Chicago because they could do it at Wintrust and there's a hotel attached to Wintrust and all that. But why are you putting that kind of stress on players when it's just completely unnecessary? I don't get it. As we all know, it all comes down to money in the case of all these professional sports. And I think the reason why they want to do this is because, uh, like you mentioned, Maggie, those players, the ones that didn't make the, the teams, they didn't make the playoffs, they've been off since early, mid-March. And let's be honest, too, on the flip side, those teams want to make up their money, which they have contracted with all these regional sports networks. They got to they get it up to a, a certain amount of games so they can – so the, these networks can get paid off. But outside of money, I, I don't see why they should be playing these games either. It just doesn't make any sense to me outside of money. I mean, and who exactly is going to spend their time watching Bulls Hawks after they haven't played in three months? Like, I, I don't need to see that. <laughs> I don't, I covered the Bulls Hawks game, I think it was like January, February. I got paid to go and I didn't want to be there. So like, <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to watch that nonsense. It's sad. Well, it, well, like you said, like you said, Maggie, I mean, you know, the, there's a hotel right there, Wintrust, the capacity is not 
too big so they can accommodate people if they want to bring fans in and like 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 you said said i mean it's all about the money with these these teams that's why when i hear people say well they should just cancel sports the rest of the year look it's 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 easier said than done. I mean, there's the, the money's the root of all of this, both pro and college. So they're going to make up their money somehow. Yeah. It, it, I mean, and that's the difficult thing. I mean, that's, it's why I'm out of a job right now is because sports aren't happening. So I have no job that, you know, I can't freelance with anybody right now. So I, I get it. I would love to be working again. So I would, I would love for sports to be back. I just, I, <laughs> I wish we could go back in time and make the whole country react like Illinois did and Chicago did, because then I feel like then the whole country would be in a much healthier situation like we are right now here in Chicago. And then I would feel more comfortable about sports being played. But right now it's just, it would be so much risk. It would be so much risk to these Mm -hmm. players, to the coaches, to the, like I was saying before, the ushers and, you know, and, and if they do it at Wintrust, then how much of that Wintrust staff is going to have to be there and all of it. It just is, uh, it just is a very exhausting thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's exhausting. <laughs> like, just, can we just do something right for the players and for their health and just say, hey, let's have a hell of an NBA season next year? Yeah. Speaking of the NBA, of course, uh, the 22 teams will go down to Orlando for the bubble. Of course, we all know not all teams are going to stay there long. The teams are going to stay there the longest, of course. The two teams are going to play in the NBA Finals, whoever that may be. But uh, looking at all the protocols and the rules, if you leave the, the bubble without permission, when you come back, you have to be quarantined for 10 days. If you leave with permission, you have to be tested every other day. Somebody has to follow you wherever you go, if it's a family emergency or something to that effect. Uh, th- there's, there's going to be tight. Uh, rules for these players and I know there's plenty of them for plenty of stuff for those players to do but when you separate themselves from their families for any length amount of time it it is going to be crazy I'm interested to see from that aspect of it I'm more interested to see the aspect of how these players going to handle their time away away from the game instead instead of the action on the court on the court I think they're going to be fine but away from the court that's going to be a bigger story I completely agree with that um it's a lot to ask of, of af- any person to say, hey, we're going to put you in a bubble for two months and you can maybe see your family from 10 feet away and you can make, you know, you could have calls with your wife and like, are you, are you kidding me? They're not going to space, but we're treating <laughs> them like they are. We're treating them like right. that's, that's what's happening. Also, Robin and Brooke Lopez are two of the biggest Disney fans in the whole wide world. Yeah is go and stay in Orlando on a Disney property and not whatever Disney opens, ride the ride. (laughs) Are you kidding me? That's so wrong. That's not going to happen. They're absolutely going to be in there. Or or, or they'll be pushing for the Bucks to lose so that they get to (laughs) go do it. (laughs) Disney stuff. Well, well, and also remember, too, that they have, like, a hotline where, you know, to kind of tell on players, the, the snitch line, as I, as I call it, <laughs> that, that, you know, let's, if you, yeah, I'll say, if you, if you break protocols or if a player breaks pro- protocols, and, you know, Stephen A. Smith said on, on first take earlier this week that, listen, you know, you're going to keep these guys away from their wives, girlfriends, kids, you know, in some cases all three. So, I, I mean, this, that, that's good. To, listen, this is going to be – this is going to be very uh, interesting and probably even problematic because with the Disney parks closing, you're not going to be able to really do anything. So you're basically going to be stuck in this, this bubble. So that's a lot to ask for a lot of these players and coaches, especially, especially the older coaches when there was rumor, rumors that they, you know, as probably was a little bit hesitant to let these older coaches come in. So this yeah. is going to get very, uh, kind of get very dicey. That, I mean, and that's the, the part of it. There's, all kinds of many of the NBA coaches are going to be or NBA support staff or whoever's going to be there. They're going to, they, they have the exact, uh, you know, things that make it worse for you to have coronavirus. A lot of them are older black men and who has been getting sick and dying from coronavirus. It's been older black people. That's been a lot of, there's been way disproportionate numbers of the deaths. And so 
it scares me to think of what's going to happen to some of these coaches if they get it, because there are plenty of coaches over 60. There are plenty of them who are black. There are plenty of them who have other, what, what are, are they called comorbidities that go with it. So, you know, I'm very, very concerned about the coaches, but I'm also concerned about the mental health of literally everybody in the bubble because we're human beings, we need our people. And I think we've learned in the last few months creative ways of having our, our people in contact with us as we're doing right now. Yeah. But we, you know, asking players to say, you can't have your wife by you or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever. That's just, that's, that's a lot to ask of any human. And I think it's going to affect who the, who wins the championship much more than what we're, what we're used to saying, like, you know, is it going to be LeBron's ability to, to put a team on his back? Is it going to be how, you know, how Giannis, handles the adversity and, and handles the playoffs. It's not going to be the normal things we talk about when we talk about breaking down a basketball game. It's going to be these much bigger adversities. I also think too, let's, let's just say heaven forbid, and I do mean heaven forbid, if LeBron James contracts this, uh, this virus or Giannis answers the cool poll, or we already saw that Kevin Durant contracted it. He wasn't even playing this year for Brooklyn. Right. So if one of those major stars catches it, let's just say if one of those players that I just mentioned were happened to be in the NBA Finals, they have to be quarantined for two weeks, which means their season is over and their team season is over right. as well. So I think if there's an outbreak, especially with the uh, superstar players, uh, the, the, the season is going to get shut down and they're going to say, hey, that's it, let's get ready for 2021. And I think the way some of these superstar players handle – the protocols and handle staying in and everything is going to set the tone a bit because if LeBron James is staying in and not, and, you know, and not going out to see his family, even as much as he misses all of them and isn't breaking the protocols, then you can bet your butt that the rest of the teams aren't going, the rest of his team isn't going to. If you you know, NBA players very much follow their leadership. So if they have good leadership on their team, then I think that that is going to set the table for them to win and to do well in this bubble situation. It's all about, it's all about setting the tone. <coughs> yeah. And which, and so, you know, as we were asking earlier about the base, about the baseball teams, who do you think has the advantages of, you know, this playing this whole bubble? Cause it's again, another unprecedented thing we're doing here. Yeah. I mean, and it's so hard. To, it's so hard to say because there still might be some players who we think are playing and then either they get sick or they opt out or, or whatever. Um, I feel like the Bucks depth is, is really a, a, a special thing for them. And so I feel like the Bucks have a good shot. Um, I, I don't think you can discount any team with LeBron James on it. And if LeBron James is healthy and into it, then, you know, he's then I think they're going to do well. The Lakers will do well. Um, but it's, it's funny, like, you look at the standings when the season just ended, and none of that means anything right now because you don't, you don't know how, they, uh, how these past few months have gone. And, like, we saw, like, that picture of Zion Williamson. We saw that he has, has dropped some weight and put yeah. on some muscle, and God bless him. Like, it, he did exactly what I did, honestly, in the pandemic. Um, I did not. I did not do, I did not, <laughs> but you know, like have, have there been some players who have been doing that who have been working their butt off and staying in shape? Are there some players who have been like, eh, I don't really feel like going, working out today. You know, like there's, and not to mention they haven't been playing live basketball for a while. So like you could be kicking ass in the gym but that doesn't mean necessarily that it'll translate to the court. So there's just so many variables that make it hard to pick that I, I really don't know. It's going to be fun to watch though. Also too, you cannot forget about the Los Angeles Clippers. No, is it a guarantee they're going to win it? No, but here's the thing about the Clippers. They have so much depth and, and they, I know they picked up Joe Kim, no, right before the shutdown, they picked up Reggie Jackson from 
Detroit. I know Lou Williams, as of, of this recording, he was undecided whether he was going to go or not. We all know he's a six-man candidate uh, scoring 20 points coming off the bench. But I'm looking at Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, both those plays, in particular Kawhi Leonard. There's no more excuses now as far as not playing back-to-backs and, and yeah. all that. Uh, everybody's on the same playing field. Everybody's on the same page. Let's get ready and, and, and let's go. And like you said, Maggie, who can su- survive this with the least amount of distraction slash injury slash virus? Right. And, of course, they are coached by Maywood Zone, Doc Rivers. So, yeah. you know, that provides a waste man. has got to gotta show strong. So, uh, you know, I, I think the Clippers, they have such depth. And now Paul George is, is he, uh, he is healthy and, like, ready to go. So, We'll see, you know, and uh, there's so many variables that we cannot account for until we actually see them on the court. And then even then, there still could be random variables that come up um, that we don't. Because here's, here's the other thing about it is, like we so sadly saw with Carl Anthony Towns, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of players who, don't, who can't really control what's happening at home. You know, if one of these players' wives or, or, or mothers or fathers gets coronavirus while they're playing, that also is something that, that could sadly affect things. So there's just, there's just so much, much thing, there's so much going on right now that is going to affect everything on the court that you can't really separate it. Like, you can't really say, like, you know, keep, keep everything separate because there's just too much. There's too much. Absolutely. So let's 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 go. Let's talk about let's talk some bulls for a second. Um, okay. we thought that maybe that Jim Boiler would be gone by now, but there have been various reports that say that that might not be the case. So, or maybe this is Arturo's kind of just trying to be like keep it very secret, and like maybe he wants to hire his you know good good friend and you know college teammate Adrian Griffith, you know, who played for the Bulls. He coached. He was just a coach for a little bit. So what the heck is going on? And why is Jim Boylan still the head coach of the Bulls, Maggie? Oh, my gosh. I wish I, I knew the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't – why? What in God's name has Jim Boylan shown that makes you say, you know what, let me give him one more chance. He, he's done – the only thing that Jim Boylan has done well is get a smaller paycheck than most NBA coaches. He, that he's cheap. That's really, that is all that he's done. He's cheap. I think he's paid, was paid a million dollars for this season, which let's get one of those jobs guys where okay. we can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Come on. Million dollars. But uh, he was paid, I believe right around a million dollars this season. And so he's a lot cheaper than other NBA coaches. And the word was that the Bulls didn't want to pay two coaches at once. I, I'm sorry. Why would you get you? You got rid of Fred Hoiberg and kept paying him. Exactly. What, yeah. Like, what? Why is it different now? Because Jim Boylan is a way worse coach than Fred Hoiberg was. So, what is different now that you're so afraid to pay two coaches? You know, it just is so so weird to me that this decision hasn't been made yet. Like, that's the whole point of bringing in a new GM and having somebody who can really take over and take care of this, the organization, if they're not going to hit, be able to do everything and get rid of the coach, then what's the point? Yeah, that's been our main concern on, on this show, Maggie, for the last few weeks, as we've, yeah. we've been hearing reports that uh, Michael Ryanster, who's the face of the franchise now running things uh, for, for Jerry, his father, it, it, the, the new management, Mark Eversley, the new GM, and Karnischewicz, as Lakina mentioned, if, if, not, if they're not both are not really allowed to do what they want to do and what they need to do, like you said, this uh, positive vibe among the fan base is, is null and void because we saw what happened throughout uh, this past season. Uh, uh, the tennis dropped for the first time in a long time. They started to dip a little bit last year, but this past season, uh, it, uh, for certain games, they got worse. You had 10,000 uh, in the, on a Monday night game in December against the Toronto Raptors. Uh, and the Bulls wanted to lie about uh, one of our colleagues tweets, uh, Terrence Thomas from Mr. Big. So, oh, that picture was taken two hours before the game and all that <laughs> nonsense. No, it was taken right at tip off. And he yeah, not 10, lying. 10, 10, 10, oh, no, fans he wasn't. At tip off, that's 10,000 fans. There. And we all know that the Ryan stores love money just like anybody else or with ownership. But when you start to look at, at those uh, those optics and, uh, and those fans not showing up, 
there's a problem. And of course, we all know what happened well, during Zach Levine's interview this during the All Star Weekend on first take at Navy Pier. Uh, right. That, that was that was, uh, it was the tipping point for the Bulls uh, to make change. Yeah, I, I mean, I I covered probably five or six Bulls games this season, and the the lack of fans was incredibly noticeable. And it wasn't an hour before tip off. It was at right. tip off at yep. the first quarter, second quarter, like, and then they would leave early. And I don't, I don't blame fans. I don't understand why they weren't doing it earlier. I really didn't understand. I want, I, I sometimes just wanted to walk up to people at games like, "Why are you here? Have you, exactly. <laughs> are you a fan of the other team? Is that what it is? Because <laughs> nothing the Bulls have done have in the past three, four seasons." has really deserved the kind of loyalty that Bulls fans have showed them. So I think it's, it's pretty impressive that fans finally were like, you know what, this is BS. We don't, we don't need to keep doing that. And so I hope, I hope that that is part of the reason why there was a change at general manager or vice president of basketball or whatever the heck his titles, everybody's titles were, but it, it, they can't do half measures and keeping Jim Boylan around is going to continue to be a half measure. They have to really just take care of all of it or what's the point? Well, we saw with the last dance, I mean, right at the end of it where it says, Hey, you know, the bulls have been rebuilding since this has been recording and they're still <laughs> rebuilding. So this, you know, unfortunately this you might feel like you got punched in the stomach when you yes. had that I sure did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That and was like a and they've been rebuilding ever since. Like, yeah, I know. And they're still my team and I don't know why. I should be a Bucks fan. The Bucks are great. They're a good team. Mm-hmm. Giannis is really cool that Giannis was out marching with Black Lives Matter. Like, this, that's the kind of team. They're only 90 miles away from us. That's the team I should be cheering for. But I, I can't. I, it's not in my makeup to cheer for it, to change my team. I just, once my team is my team, you're my team, and that's it. So I'm a Bulls fan, and this is what I got to watch. <laughs> And speaking of the Bulls, Lakeen, I know you were at a game uh, earlier this season uh, yep. against, I think I want to say Minnesota, yep. uh, currently the town dropped 40, but uh, I, I remember watching that game on TV. We talked about it on the show at the time. There were not many fans. Maybe no, there were more than expected, but there weren't that many fans. I would say it was, I would say it was about 80% full. I would say 75 to 80% full. And the United Center is so big yeah. that when it's, yeah. it's 80% full, that is noticeable. That that it is. not being gone is very noticeable because it's just so so big in that place. So yeah, yeah. Sport, sports veteran talk show host and writer Maggie Hendricks, formerly the Six Seventy Score, join, is joining us right here on Sega TV Sports Zoom style, along with Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. Before we move on to other sports, Maggie, since you brought it up, uh, the last dance. Of course, we were entertained by it in, in late. April and early May by ESPN uh, with four or five weeks. I know you're Chicago and just like us, and not to out age you or anything like that, but it sounds, it sounds like to me you are the same age group as us, you know, born in the 80s, and we watch this franchise go from the bottom to the top. And as yeah. I said uh, to people all uh, these last few weeks, my late mother, her family friend, has season tickets to the, uh, to the Bulls games at Old Chicago Stadium. It, it was a pleasure watching Michael Jordan and those guys grow from uh, contenders to championship winners. I wanted to ask you, were, uh, outside of the championships, what were your best memories as a Bulls fan growing up in the city of Chicago? Well, so I grew up in Melrose Park, just so just west of the city. Um, and it's still Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Melrose Park is close enough that we're still Chicago. You know, exactly. I mean, right. I'm still <laughs> Chicago enough. Um, but uh, in that like that was so many of my family memories it's it wasn't even just about watching the team it was about watching the team go into games with my sister and like we went to a finals game at the old stadium uh in 1992 we went to i think it was game two we went to game they lost i know they lost that game yeah um, that was a danny Ainge game <laughs> yeah it was. That's exactly what it was so um you know I, like 
it's not even just about getting to watch this incredible team, but it was also, yeah, going to the rally with my sister, watching the game with my parents and like remembering every time they won us just going nuts in our front room and like that, it's that whole, like the whole thing of it, like that was very much looking at my teenage years. I was born in 79. So like right, you know, right in the cusp of the eighties. And so the 91 through 90, what was it? Eight bulls. Mm -hmm. That was my teenage years. And you know how formative those years are to you as a sports fan. So I got very used to, first of all, celebrating championships. I just thought that's what you did all the time. So like I got very, you know, (laughs) that was like my every June, like every Father's Day, we would just get my dad both championship t-shirts, you know, like that was just what you did. And so, you know, I think it's like the, not just the memories of the team winning, though I love them. I love Horace Grant. I love B.J. Armstrong. Getting to meet Horace Grant as an adult and, like, getting to know Bill Wennington and Will Perdue from just, like, being around the United Center is just hilarious to me because, like, I worshipped them when I was a teenager. (laughs) It's just, like, every time I see Will Perdue and he's like, hey, Maggie, I'm like, this is so (laughs) Aw. Yeah, so, but it just, everything about getting to watch The Last Dance brought back a lot of great memories of watching it with my family and everything that that team was to us growing up. Yeah, speaking of Horace Grant, uh, according to him on camera, he did not tell Sam Smith anything, but that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> the what I'm going to say is there's no way Sam Smith could have written a, a book like that with one source. Yeah, of course not. Many sources. So, yeah. you know, Horace has gotten the Horace has gotten the the snitch tag for it, but I don't know if he deserves all of it. No, I think it probably goes around. No, not not at all. I think that, like I said, there there were multiple people involved that talked to him. So yeah. let's, yeah. So like, like like we've been saying for the like last few weeks, that you know, for a few weeks of when the the when in the cusp mm. of that of the last dance happening, yeah, that that's yeah. Well, we'll probably never know who, but. You know, there, there were definitely more than one culprit or one snitch, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about like going on the ice here. Yeah, the NHL, they're doing kind of like a, a tournament style that, that's happening. Um, I, I believe. Let's it's, do that hockey. Exactly. Um, um, yeah. Hockey. Let's do that hockey. Um, I have too much chance when it comes to this, but, but, I, but I pay attention to, enough to the Blackhawks. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So we all thought that maybe the Hawks was going to be over and done with, with them, but now they are going to be able to play in this. They're still working on the parameters of it. So what do you think of the Hawks chances in this sort of tourney style, you know, Stanley Cup playoff thing? Well, you know, this is one of those times that that veteran leadership can really come in handy when you have Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane telling you what you need to do to win a championship. And it's in this very weird tournament, you know, and you're not dealing with all the nagging injuries that you had from the season and you're, you're, you might be in healthy and good shape. The, the thing that's going to make hockey really, really interesting is that most ice rinks all of them have been closed to everybody. Mm -hmm. So like hockey players, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of in shape when you're in hockey shape because you're getting it from skating on the ice. It's just, it's a different, even all of the different training things you can do at home. There's only so much of it that if you don't have your own ice and I'm guessing most players don't. So that's what I think is going to be really interesting about this is seeing how these players can even get back into hockey playing shape and, and giving hits and taking hits and all of these things because it's been a while since they've been able to do it. So I think the team that is healthiest is going to have the best chance of winning it because and like I feel like it's another one of those things you just throw out what those records were because if you are healthy enough – if you if your players were able to stay in decent shape and able to get back on the ice and be comfortable, then you're in a good good shot for the rest of the season. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Maggie. Everybody's on the even playing field now. The the players that were supposed to be healthy, they are healthy. The ones that they are injured in terms of the Blackhawks, like Brent Seabrook and Andrew Schultz, they're not going to play. So 
they'll stay on the injury list for the, uh, the rest of the season. I want to ask you a, a broader question about the NHL. Uh, as I've been saying on this show for the last few weeks, even though we know now that the NHL is going to compete against uh, the NFL, at least the start of their season, they're going to compete against baseball. They're going to compete against the NBA. Do you think that uh, the NHL will have the opportunity to grab new fans because of this new term- tournament format? Because five of the original six teams minus Detroit are in this tournament. You have all the Canadian teams that are in this tournament. You have two of the New York area teams that are in it with the New York Rangers and the Islanders. Do you think it depends on who advanced? Do you think the NHL can grab some new uh, new fans here? Absolutely. I think that this could be a chance for them to show off what's fun and what's what's different about hockey. Um, I think they have a couple different opportunities. I think, the, first of all, that they have this tournament that's, you know, going to be different than anything else we've seen. And quite frankly, the Stanley Cup playoffs are the very best of all the playoffs. Yes. They just, even when I'm not paying attention to a hockey season at all, when you get to the Stanley Cup playoffs and particularly the Stanley Cup final, I'm watching it because it's just, they like, it just is a whole different level. So I think that, you know, they can possibly win fans. And I think the fact that in these past few months and as, as Black Lives Matter has become something that more, more athletic teams are, more, more teams are talking about and being open about, I think it's also the chance for them to get to say, hey, we do have black players and we do have, and this sport really is for everybody. You know, they've, they've, they've been saying that for years. Hockey is for everybody. But they've been not doing much to back it up. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, look at all the stuff that PK Subban has gone through and Akeem Alou and all these players. So if they do a good job of saying not only is hockey is for everybody, but we are going to actually support our black players, support all of our players of color, and make sure that they are comfortable on the ice and every single fan who has a problem with it is ejected out on their butt, then that is another way they can win fans because I think that there are plenty of people, and not just black people, all people who are put off by the fact that hockey is so hockey can be so insular and not welcoming. Mm-hmm. So if they do a good job of supporting and, say, and saying, no, we're not an insular sport, we do want everybody to get involved with it, then, you know, it can, it can be a very good opportunity for them. Yeah, and also promotions, too, and promoting their players. Because you look at Jerome Aguilar, who just got in the Hockey Hall of Fame, you, you know, most, if you ask most people how he looks, no one could tell you how he looks. So that's another problem that hockey has had in for so many years so that's oh, the another thing people they, that I saw that were like he didn't deserve it I'm like oh god now, that, you not only don't know hockey you also don't know what crap that man had to put up with oh yeah years. exactly so, totally yeah. absolutely yeah also too yeah also too congratulations to Mary Halsa and the uh, former Hawk Doug Wilson for both making the Hockey Hall of Fame so we'll Clap it up yeah. for them as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Family. Final. Finally, yeah. Doug Wilson got in. How's it? How was it like 20 years since, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's crazy. He should have been in. Well, yeah. and it, it's so fun to see Jose get that first, first yep. ballot recognition. Because, like, in Chicago, he was the savior. So we're all like, yeah, it does, doesn't he have a statue of him? Like, what do we – what what needs to happen to honor Mary and Jose? Um, but I think uh, around the league, people were a little bit less – less convinced, but I'm glad that they, that didn't keep them, keep him off the, off of the Hall of Fame, because he should be there. Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of the Blackhawks, before we move on, Maggie, uh, of course, John McDonough is out as president of the Blackhawks. Um, Stan Bowman still has his job for what reason, I don't know. Jeremy Colleton is still the head coach. I know some Hawks fans had some choice for his words for him, but We'll keep it clean for this podcast. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, of course, there's been rumors that uh, um, Rocky Wirtz's son may take over McDonough's spot. Uh, Patrick Sharp's name's been thrown around to, to work in the front office as well. What direction do you see the Blackhawks going into filling uh, the, the spots uh, vacated by McDonough? I mean, most of McDonough's job didn't have to do a ton with the on-ice stuff. It was much more the marketing, promotion, you know, ticket sponsorship, all of that. So 
if Rocky Wirtz's son can do a good job of parlaying his last name into making sure that the Blackhawks have the kind of money they need to play to pay their players, then sure, great. But if if there's a lot of of wor- a lot of focus on the hockey side of the operations, you know, Stan Bowman, he did a great job for quite a few years, but I I don't really understand it what exactly he is bringing to the team now. Um, And like Jeremy Collinson's so young that I had hoped he would be like, I I thought I didn't think Quentinville should have gotten fired in the first place, particularly not the way he was fired. So Mm -hmm. early early in the season, but okay. So you bring in this young guy so he can connect with players better. Okay. He's not doing that. So how much slack is he given? I mean, I, I'm, I don't know. There's so much I don't understand about the, the way the Blackhawks operate. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't quite get it, but we'll, we'll see. And <laughs> yeah, they're also in this position now that they could end up making a weird run for it. And maybe we'll end up having another parade, though it'll be next year. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, a virtual parade. Yes. All right. So I would say, I would also, uh, before, you know, let's, let's do some NFL football. You got the bears, bears made some big moves, you know, Nick Foles, they've signed Nick Foles and also Robert Quinn and some, and some other, uh, some other big free agent signings. What do you think about the bears moves? I mean, in a vacuum, I think it's going to be interesting. I feel like there could have been better players to fit into this, to whatever system Matt Nagy has than necessarily Nick Foles. But I understand also why he went with Nick Foles, considering Nick Foles played for Doug Peterson and they have similar uh, systems and all that. But I don't know. I feel like it's, it's again, the Bears doing half measures and trying to figure out how to fix the mistake they made in drafting Mitch Trubisky in the first place. And now it's like, it's, it's too late. He's on the team. You, you did all of it. There are no first round draft picks for a while. So this is just where we're at. Um, and so I, I, I think I'm excited about Quinn on defense. I'm excited about making sure that they're, 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 I'm excited about things that could happen with the Bears, but I also feel like there's a lot of questions that are are we would normally answer in training camp, and now I don't even we don't even know exactly what training camp is going to be. Yeah, I couldn't agree with with you more, Meg, in terms of what training camp is going to look like. It's going to be different for all these teams because, as we all know, we'll dive into it in a minute as far as preseason being condensed from four games to two. But sticking with the quarterback position for the Bears, as I said on this program for the last few months, I thought that the Bears should have went after Cam Newton. But like you said, first you beat us to the punch. The Bears always like to play it safe. And the situation is no different here. Uh, They want to find out everything about Trubisky. Should he be the number one quarterback uh, moving forward? Because we all know that they did not pick up his fifth-year option. They want to give him some competition but not – uh, scare him for a lack of a better term because we all know that the problems that he suffered through last year outside of his shoulder injury, it was in his head. And I think they tried to turn him into a, a pocket passer to protect his shoulder, injured shoulder. And we all saw that that did not work. Cam Newton, who, who was signed by the Patriots uh, last weekend, he's still better than Trubisky right now. But honestly, why the Bears did it, of course, we all know that GM Ryan Pace, his job's on the line this year. Matt Nagy uh, entering his third year. His job is on the line as well as the Bears are trying to make it back to the playoffs. But this is business as usual for Chicago. I mean, it's unusual because there's so much on the line, but it's not unusual for the Bears to not know what they're doing at quarterback. I mean, that's been happening since Sid Luckman. So it's, you know, it's, it's always been <laughs> – it's always been an issue for the Bears. It's so frustrating to consistently watch – teams like say like the Packers and I know I hate the Packers as is as determined by law I have to hate the Packers <laughs> but watching them just develop one Hall of Fame quarterback after another it's like 
are you kidding me? And then the Bears have had something like 27 quarterbacks and all that. Yep. And, all the time. Yeah. And, and so what I would love to see the Bears do is take chances in a way, take more calculated chances instead of just constantly playing it safe. And, I, you know, there's, we can go back and get mad at all over again about the Bears drafting Mitch Trubisky instead of Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes. Um, I am, I am always a little bit mad about that all the time. Um, especially if I'm not meeting with Deshaun Watson, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but we are here. We're here where we are. The bears have the quarterback that quarterbacks that they have. And the only thing we can do is hope that this competition will, I feel like this competition is either going to make Mitch into the most confident man in the world or it's going to wreck him because the, I feel like there's not, there's no in between with him. So uh, I guess we'll see how all this goes. It's going to be interesting to watch, but I, I, it's going to be interesting to watch in the way that it's interesting to watch a car crash, not in a way that's like, <laughs> Oh my team. I, it's interesting to watch because my team's going to win the Super Bowl. I, I don't think anybody's in Chicago is going to be winning the Super Bowl anytime soon. But uh, we might get some entertainment. Yeah, yeah, it might it might be entertaining. So, uh, what about the defense? Because like like I said, you know, they brought in more, uh, Robert Quinn, veteran defensive end. Do you think the Bears have a shot at becoming back that being that top five defense we saw a couple of years ago? I think so. I think they have the personnel for it, especially when uh, with Danny Trevathan if he's healthy and good shape this season. Because I think in the loss of him. And of Akeem Hicks was a lot more than the Bears were willing to talk about. But those were the two leaders on defense. It wasn't even just their abilities on the, on the uh, field, but also their ability to lead on the field. And so without those two guys, uh, they were a little bit unmoored. And so when you, when you bring them two back, and uh, Akeem Hicks has been vocal about being excited to be back and everything. So um, – I think it's. I think that the defense can be that exciting, exciting. Uh, just you can't take your eyes off on defense. You don't go to the bathroom when the Bears are defense on defense. You do it when they're on offense <laughs> <laughs> because they can. You know, and then when you put Robert Quinn in there and you have Akeem Hicks, then Khalil Mack will have so much more room to do the things that Khalil Mack does. So, you know, those can be some exciting things. And we'll see if everybody stays healthy and everything. That could be a very exciting defense. And then that also makes the whole quarterback situation less important. Because if you have a really good defense and you have a running game, oh, please, dear God, actually use a running game, yeah. <laughs> then you could actually be a good team. But, you know, there's a lot of ifs in that sentence. Yeah, you brought up the running game, Maggie, and I've been saying on this show and with our guests for the past few weeks, we all saw flashes of what, what David Montgomery could be, the now second year running back out of, of Iowa State. We saw moments of, of, of greatness from him last year with 100-yard games and things along that line. But like, like you said before, uh, head coach Matt Nagy was uh, stubborn to use the running game in a consistent way because especially after the injury to Mitch Trubisky, I, I want to see how he's going to be used in year two because assuming that Trubisky's healthy and he has the job, whoever has the quarterback job, if it's him or Nick Foles, how is Coach Nick going to use the running game uh, in, into the offense? Because we all know it's a passing offense, but will the running game be used a little bit more or will they just sho shove it away and use it every once in a blue moon? Because I think if they do that, this offense is in trouble. I completely agree with that because, I mean, the defense the defense that's facing the Bears always knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's never a surprise. There's never anything different. So hopefully Matt Nagy has learned from this from last season. Hopefully the stubbornness won't will out because if it does, then the Bears are going to be in the same situation they were last season. Because David Montgomery, I feel like, was ready to do much more last season. Yeah. He just yep. wasn't allowed to he wasn't given the room to to run and so I, I would love to see David Montgomery do more you know because he is so talented um but it's it's all up to Nagy and his his ability to actually value the run 
what about Allen Robinson? Because I think I think he's poised for even bigger gear than he's been the last few years to get that big payday that he deserves. Oh yeah, I mean that's that when that's on the line, when money's on the line, you're always gonna. We all do that. We'll work a little bit harder. Okay. Um, yeah. I think we're gonna see some big things out of him. Uh, it's funny. A, a friend of mine who writes for Bleacher Report, Brent Zbleski, he was writing this morning about how he thinks that Anthony Miller is gonna have a big season. Um, that he's just poised for that big season. So, you know, that would be great. That would, I think the most important thing that the Bears will need to do to ensure that their wide receivers have good seasons is make that decision on quarterback and who's going to be the starting quarterback early so that, that then those receivers can have, can make, you know, really make the connections. And I think what was great with Allen Robinson last season is that he made that connection with Mitch and they like were on that same page and they were in a good spot. And so they were, you know, they, when Mitch was playing well, it was because he was getting the ball to Allen Robinson. Maggie Hinch is veteran sports talk show host and writer, formerly a 670 score. Join us right here on Sega City Sports Zoom style, along with Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. Maggie, let's go to a broader, uh, spectrum of the NFL course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, training camps will start in, a, in about three weeks. Of course, the, the preseason has been cut from four weeks to two weeks. The Hall of Fame game between Pittsburgh and Dallas has been canceled. And the Hall of Fame, uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame ceremony has been canceled for this year as well. Shout out to Jim O'Cobra from the 85 Bears. He was a, he's still a Hall of Famer, but we won't see him on the stage this year. We'll have to wait till next year. I want to ask you, Maggie, of course, has been concerned about uh, the player safety and uh, social distancing uh, in the building, they can do that. But once you get out on the football field, uh, it's going to be a different story. I, I was watching Sports Center before we recorded today. Uh, they were talking about uh, the NFL trying to, um, it, on the consideration of making these special helmets, but they might, the players uh, have been saying uh, they might have problem with them breathing and, and seeing. Uh, what do you think about all this? I am really concerned about offensive linemen. That offensive linemen and defensive linemen, but more offensive. Because like we were talking about earlier, they're heavier. They're, you know, they, they carry a lot of the, the preconditions that make coronavirus a bigger problem. And they're also in a situation when they're lined up. Think of how football players line up. Right. And, you, and think mm-hmm. of all those, those cold weather games where we see those puffs of smoke, but the, the, their breathing puffs and it's frozen yeah. coming yep. out. They're sharing their breathing space. And that, more than anything, is what, is what spreads the coronavirus. Yep. And then, then they're already predisposed to these issues. I am very concerned about offensive linemen. And I'm very concerned about what that will mean for teams because six foot five, 325 pound guys don't grow on trees. So, mm-hmm. what do these teams do? You know, if they do end up losing players to coronavirus, there's not a huge, it's not like, say, wide receiver or safety. If a wide receiver or safety goes down, there are so many other players out there on, on teams who are, are ready, you know, who are on the uh, practice team or whatever, who are ready to go and get, can get signed up. Offensive linemen, there's only so many of them. So, I'm very concerned both about their health, mostly about their health, but also their ability, like teams' abilities to replace them. It's not, it's not great. So I, I, am there, I have a lot of concerns about the NFL. It is an outdoor sport. So again, most of the time it's an outdoor sport. So if you, you, know, if you can use that and make sure that players are, are being as distant as they can be. But like you said, once the game starts, you can't, you can't be distant on a football field. You can't distantly tackle somebody. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely concerned about the health of these players. Well, Kevin Harlan, um, I heard him on a podcast earlier this week. I forgot which one it was, but he kind of brought up the idea that you know, he's been, he's been vacationing in Lake Michigan with his family. So he hasn't really talked to anybody, but he brought up an idea of maybe the NFL only probably playing six games, maybe and just do like a d- divisional games and then maybe add like a couple of interconference games or maybe one, what within the conference. So he says that that he hasn't talked to anybody. He hasn't, you know, he has, this is something that he, he thought of in his head. So what do you the guys think about that sort of idea? I mean, I, I think 
the NFL needs to be prepared for that kind of season and have contingency plans because I, I don't think 16 – I don't think every team is getting to 16 games. I don't think there's going to be a 17-week season. I, I think that's folly to, to even count on that. So, you know, they're going to need to figure out some sort of backup plans. And, and like, one of the things that I saw the NFL did do with their scheduling is – Every team, like there, there's basically a way that your first, I believe it's your first week game, you're on the same bye as that team. So like say the Bears and Packers were supposed to play week one. I don't know their schedule off the top of my head. Then they would have the same bye week. So if those first week games have to be canceled, it'll be easy to fill them in. But even beyond that, I, I just I just don't see a 16-game season. I'm not trying to say I don't want it. I want sports so much, but what's in, but I I don't know if it's there's going to be a healthy way for it to happen. I kind of agree with you there, Maggie. But I think you should, we should be concerned with more with college football. We had Dion Miller from APC Seven on a couple of weeks ago, and she said if anything is going to change drastically in terms of football, it would be college because. Where we we all been watching and and listening to the stories of the Clemson players and the Alabama players holding these non um, um, facial mask parties and catching corona and people trying to come up with this quote unquote theory that if you catch it now and by the time that your practice has started you can start the season on time which I think is ridiculous but with that being said uh, college football it looks like it's going to come down to to the the eleventh hour. And we all know that the NCAA is in shambles for other reasons as well. We won't get into that too much. But I think if you see any drastic changes, it will be in college football. Just You could just play your conference schedule, maybe one or two games out of conference. You'll still have a season. And I think the networks will be pleased with ESPN, Fox, and CBS. They will, they will recoup some money, but not in terms of a full schedule should that not come to fruition. It's – it is quite frankly, it should be criminal what's happening to a lot of these college football players right now. I think Dabo Swinney needs to be prosecuted. I'm not even kidding. That he keeps pushing practices and they keep getting infected. Mm-hmm. And again, when you're ta- if you're talking about the you know, wide receiver or a safety, maybe that's not a problem. But these offensive linemen, how, are, how healthy are they going to be? Not to mention... It's COVID-19 because it was discovered last year, in December of last year. We do not know the long-term effects of this disease. My sister had it, and she, is, and she recovered fully, and she's fine now, but she still doesn't have her win back. She still is not back to feeling like herself, and she's been recovered for months now. We do, we do not know at all the long-term effects of this. And when you are making college players who are not paid for their time, who are not being given the same sort of collective bargaining rights that NFL players and NBA players have, they don't don't have any rights in this situation. They don't have anybody fighting for them. And nobody is saying, like, there's nobody stopping it. And there's nobody saying to Dabo Swinney and to the AD at Clemson, what you're doing is criminal, but it is like getting mm-hmm. these kids sick. And this idea, like you said, it's ridiculous. This thing of, of like, oh, well, we'll just get sick now. We can't get sick later. We don't know if it's like the chicken pox man. We don't know, you know, like we have mm-hmm. no idea what they're doing to this. And when you're saying to a 20 year old kid, Hey, yeah, you might get the coronavirus, but you might not. So you better be at practice or you're not going to play for me this fall. And that kid thinks he's going to play in the pros. So either way, he's going to be endangering his career. Because if Dabo Swinney tells all of these NFL coaches that he, you know, he's not a hard worker at practice, that guy's going to get knocked down a few draft rounds. Or if he goes out on that field and he gets coronavirus and it, it messes with his lungs, that could also affect his career. So these kids are screwed yeah. if they do or if they don't. It just – it. It enrages me. I'm already. I'm not the biggest college football fan in the first place because I hate of how it takes advantage of of kids. Mm-hmm. But this just is. It makes my blood boil. It makes me so angry. 
Well, well, and I think you know, think you you hit it on the nail on the nail, Mac. I mean, you got all these colleges and some of these teams getting sick. Also, Alabama, also Oklahoma State. You know, they've had some players, and I thought there was some Texas players too, some Texas athletes too that got sick. And I mean, like I've been saying this, I've been saying this for like the last month, so that you know this. Money, unfortunately, is the root, and yeah. we've already mm-hmm. had sports who in in schools where sports have either been canceled or they've been cut because there wasn't money coming in. There just needs to be like a sort of a czar, if you will, for the NCAA to kind of like someone to unilaterally say, okay, you know, let's slow down, you know, let, let, let's mm-hmm. see how, you know, this affects of it. And then maybe if you want to do just do conference games or maybe add a, a, a non-conference game or two, fine, you get eight or nine games, fine. That's what the Ivy League's doing. Um, and then the fans ask. I know you're wearing, you're wearing your Missouri shirt, Maggie. I don't know how. I think it's like 60, 70,000 thousand people at that stadium in Columbia, right. yeah. somewhere around there. So you're not going to get that many fans. So you'll probably get maybe twenty, twenty five percent at most, maybe fifty percent in some areas. So they they've got to recruit that money somehow, and it'll make the the schools happy, the TV networks happy. So I just I just don't think what else that we can do here. Well, I mean, you can make stop paying your college coaches millions of dollars. Just there, that I think is the first place the money should come from is from these coaches who are the most, the highest paid uh, public state employees in almost every state. That probably, to me, is the first place that you go. But right, I'm, I'm, you know, that is where I see it. I'm realistic. I know that's not happening, but mm-hmm. um, and that, and like, I like the shirt I'm wearing is a Missouri wrestling shirt. I am a big fan of non-college football, non-men's basketball, college sports. I am very concerned about what all what a lack of a football season is going to do to these colleges, and I, you know, how many sports will get cut, and how many athletes who aren't going to play, play pro in whatever sport, what opportunities they're going to lose to get a college education for free. I, I'm very concerned about that. But I also, I, I find it rather disingenuous when I see um, college uh, presidents and college athletic directors and football coaches and basketball coaches crying poor, we have to have this season, when you're like paying a strength coach $600,000. Like, mm-hmm. perhaps you can rebudget a little bit. You know, when, you're, <laughs> when your strength coach is getting paid more than the entire gymnastics team budget, yeah. Then that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's a problem. <laughs> you know, you, you bring up an interesting point, Maggie, uh, about uh, how these other sports are, are, are suffering because as we all know, with these big power schools like Michigan to let's just say UCLA and Texas, North Carolina and Duke, if, with the success of your football team and or your basketball team, which is used University of Michigan as an example, with, with all the money coming in with, with both of those sports, it pays for your golf team, your wrestling team, like you said, Maggie, your gymnastics team. People could roll their eyes if you want to, but if it wasn't for basketball and football with the economics of it, with right. that money coming in, those other programs wouldn't exist. And those kids participating in, in those uh, quote-unquote non-traditional sports, uh, uh, it, it's very important to them. And we've seen it, we've seen it in those mid-major schools, too, as those sports are with soccer uh, getting cut. And we just saw Morehouse down in Atlanta. They're canceling their football season. I know they're not power, part of the Power uh, Five Power Five conference, but we're already starting to see uh, sports um, in, uh, in small school, uh, school schools. Sorry, getting cut. Look at Chicago State. Their baseball program has been good for the last few years. They they just got cut as well. You so, can't just cut a bunch of sports too. I mean, yeah, and that's, yeah. and that's exactly. as big of an athletic department as you get. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough situation, but I I also think that like if you are working in college athletics, you should be working to serve the students. And if you can't right. come up with a good way to keep your football players safe and you know make sure everybody has opportunities, then maybe this isn't the right the right uh, place for you to be working. You know. Well, yeah, I, I look I'm with you, and, and since you said like Chicago State is probably one of the top mid major programs but unfortunately you know their their sport got cut and if you know this doesn't it you know if there's no control of all of this I mean you're gonna be seeing a lot more sports get cut unfortunately yeah yeah it's it's gonna be tough 
a good friend of mine is an associate athletic director at a, a mid-major school and she's she's very concerned about what's you know where they're going to find all the money but I will tell you she's she's trying to be creative and I, I hope that's what's happening at every single athletic department that there's some creativity before the cuts happen yeah. Before we move on, I want to go back to the NFL, the business side of it. I was, uh, I think I said the uh, interview to you, Lakina, yesterday. I don't know if yep. you had a chance to listen to it. I listened to it, yeah. Yeah, okay. I did, yeah. Okay, well, tell me, I'll, I'll refer to you now, Mackie, in our audience. Uh, there was an NFL insider who covers the now the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, he was on a local uh, sports radio station in Los Angeles. He was talking about uh, he had an interview with uh, Raiders owner Mark Davis. Of course, his famous father was the late Al Davis. And, of course, they had that new stadium this year. And that's why they moved to Vegas. And the NFL passed uh, a referendum uh, last week saying that uh, whether uh, your city is allowed to have fans or not, the first eight rows will be closed off due to the pandemic. It will be sold as, adver- sold as advertising for wherever companies that they choose to advertise for. And Mark Davis said in the interview that if he's not allowed to have 100% fans in there allowed by the governor of uh, Nevada, he said that he's not going to tarp off the first eight rows as it was mandated last week by the NFL. He's going to uh, elect to not have any fans in there. From a business perspective, I can understand where he's coming from. But we, as we all know, if you know your history, uh, the Davis family in the NFL had had their mm-hmm. history with both the late Roger – not sorry – the late Pete Rosell and, and, and the late Al Davis, but it could be a, a tough situation uh, uh, for the Raiders in the NFL ahead. Also, too, the new state in Los Angeles for the Raiders, not for the Raiders, for the Chargers and the Rams. Uh, the, I think it's SoFi Stadium. Yep. Uh, I think uh, games are sold out for the Rams. I think for the Chargers, too. So it, it could be a, a, a tough situation for the for, uh, for those three franchises as new stadiums are, are hopefully to open on time. Well, maybe that should teach him a lesson about moving out of the towns where you had a fan base. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think that Mark Davis is as, as, as strong and as tough as his father. So, uh, like, because the reason why the Al Davis-Pete Rosell battles were always so good is because Al Davis would, was so strong and would never back down. I don't know if we're going to see that with Mark Davis. I'm not going to besmirch a man's haircut, but you guys can go look for yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, him. You know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see him having that kind of strength. I think the other reason that they want to rope off the, eight, the first eight, eight rows is to make sure that there aren't fans breathing on the players. Right. Right. So I get that. Um, and you may as well make money with that. Because, like, when you look at the Premier League or the NWSL, that's what they've been doing. They have, yeah. big, you know, they have, they have yeah. advertisements on everything. Uh-huh. So you may as well make the money that you're not going to get in those seats. I don't, I don't really understand why Mark Davis is making this his, like, sticking point. But <laughs> there's a lot I don't understand about that man, so. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, and, and, and look, at the, look at the Korean soccer. I mean, they have, like, cardboard cutouts of some, you know, of fans. And, and I, I've, I've said, and said that you know this, I've said it before, maybe put, like, monitors up with fans, like, have, like, a Zoom sort of mm-hmm. game through the monitor so that, you know, well, aids. I, yeah, I guess the NWSL was doing something like that. Something like, like that, yeah. yeah. Like, you, like, tweeted your, your picture of you cheering their, on your team at home then they put that on the monitor so that the players could see it. So yeah. there were there there is some of that. So hopefully, you know, teams can get creative and really rely on their social media to make it so that there are is some sort of fan presence, but it's just all weird. Like <laughs> pumping in crowd noise. And I know Melvin Gordon said that listen, if we if I have to play, he's in Devon now, but I if I have to play without fans, look I'm I play for the Chargers for about four, four or five years of my career. So I'm used to not playing with, with a lot of fans. So he's used to that. But look, I mean, it's going to be very interesting, though, with all of this with the NFL. I mean, will they have to maybe make some changes? I mean, the one thing that, that is, has worked in NFL's favor is time. So, you know, we're not going to have any, like, inter-conference, like, you know, there's no Bears playing in Denver this year. There will be none of that. So, and like you said, so there will be no, like, pre, you know, uh, Hall of Fame game, so that mm-hmm. they don't have to worry about that either. And also, no, yeah, pre- no joint practices this year. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, only two preseason games, which I gotta say, I'm fine with because I don't think you need four preseason games. 
just play one with all of your you know, stars start and you know the, the second one could be like for the, the third and fourth stringers to fight for a roster spot so I'm fine with the two preseason games I think that should be something that should be the new norm what do you guys think oh absolutely the the first preseason game is useless and the fourth preseason game is useless mm-hmm. why keep it around it, they made no sense there was no nothing was learned there so I, you know, I, I didn't like any of the preseason games. I always, I, I always thought it was ridiculous that they, that uh, season ticket holders had to pay full price for those. Right. Yeah, um, bad. So I, I, I say let's get rid of it. Like, you need one, maybe two, but more than that is ridiculous. And asking for injury, and you just like injuries are going to be enough of an issue this year without having full training camps and full everything. So let's not ask for more of them. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Maggie. Uh, they were talk- the NFL was talking about this before this uh, pandemic took place anyway. Of course, we all know now that you have seven teams per conference with the one extra playoffs by which starts this year. But going back to the preseason, yes, yeah, you only need two preseason games, to be honest with you. And like we said before, uh, there's not a sellout crowd for these games anyway because you're paying full price for a preseason game. So let's be honest here. Most of the plays you're coming to see, like at the Deshaun Watson or Allen Robinson or Aaron Donald or Dak Prescott, they're sitting in street clothes anyway. So what's the point of having four games? I know the owners make money off of it, but outside of that, I don't see the point with having four preseason games. And, and most of your players are not playing in it half the time anyway. Exactly. Yep. Oh, to- yeah, totally agree. So – do you, do you guys think there's going to be a full 16 games? I mean, are we going to only to play like maybe eight or 10 games or 12 games, maybe five or six? I feel like 10 to 12 is, is what we'll see. Because I'm cautious. again, Florida, yeah, ahead, oh, sorry. Again, Florida, Arizona, and Texas. And there are so many teams in those three states. And yep. those are the states that are, are really surging right now in California too. That's like half the NFL. So, uh, you know, like, I, I don't know. There's going to have to be some major behavioral changes by the entire country if it's really important for us to watch football. And we're going to need to do it, like, 10 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cautiously optimistic, but if, if, if this doesn't change within the next month or two, there will be changes to the NFL season. And, and like Mackie said, uh, they they better have some contingency plans because if things don't go smoothly, and things can get chaotic real quick. And so, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that they'll get through the season, but we'll we'll see. Let's just say they do. Uh, I know that Dr. Fauci was on the on these uh, radio uh, shows nationally saying that that football needed a bubble. But as we've been saying throughout these last few minutes, you can't really have a bubble for football. Yes, it's outside. Yes, you have a few uh, stadiums that they are indoors, but you can't really protect football players. You can do as much as you can, but you can't really protect themselves from everything. Yeah, absolutely. Also, the roster size, too. I mean, are you going to be able to control, you know, 53 guys and plus their coach, plus coaches and plus, you know, other staff and trainers and such? And, you know, some of these coaches probably got to stay away from their families. I mean, going back to college for a second, Penn State head, head college football coach James Franklin said that he has to stay away from his family for these next few months mm-hmm. when the season starts because I think he said one of his kids has sickle cell and and I think his wife also has some some uh, has had some uh, medical issues too so and a lot of coaches are going to be are saying the same thing so this is going to be a very interesting and could lead to chaotic so I don't know what's going to happen it's going to be very something to look out for no doubt. Maggie Hendricks, a veteran sports talk show host and writer, joins us on Sega City Sports Zoom style. Hello with Lakina McGee. I'm Sydney Brown. And we're, uh, well, since we have you here, Maggie, for our last few minutes, uh, we, we all know uh, we haven't had sports for the past three to four months. Of course, we had the murder of George Floyd and, of course, other um, murders of, on our black men and women over the past few weeks before the tipping point of, of George Floyd's death. Uh, we've seen, of course, all black athletes, black American athletes protest. Uh, we've seen athletes from other countries protest as well, of course. But we've seen a lot of white athletes uh, step up as well, whether it's through television, social media, and things along that line. I want to get your thoughts, Maggie, of uh, 
what has been your overall feelings about uh, people coming together to uh, to uh, make a change in our society? It's long overdue. Um, it is, but it it's happening now. So I, I'm going just going to be happy about it. I hate that it took the death of George Floyd and the je death of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and, uh, and and way way too many black people have have been killed by the police. Uh, but the fact that it's it is happening now that we're seeing athletes of all colors get on board with this and listen to their teammates and listen to the people who are saying no this is the crap i have to deal with every single day because i'm black i you know i think that's it that's a really really important conversation that's happening now um and i I'm, I'm every time i see an athlete another athlete feel feel the freedom to speak up uh, particularly, I'm seeing like black athletes, which I think is so great, finally feel the strength to say, I, you know, black lives matter. And you all, if you care about me on the court, you need to care about me when I'm driving my car home. You need to care about me when I'm sitting in my house. You need to care about me all the time. And I, I'm really, really glad that this moment is allowing so many athletes to feel strong enough to say that. It's now, of course, changing things systemically, changing things. I mean, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. It's, a, it's no. all about, you know, making sure that this isn't just a moment from Hamilton. It is a movement. So um, making sure that, that things don't, that not everything does go back to whatever normal is. Because if we go back to normal, then we're continuing to ignore systemic racism. And I'm not okay with that. And I certainly assume you two aren't okay with that either we're not and also and also it's good to see like the coaches being very more vocal i mean tom herman just went in on you know that the texas fans saying look you know i want you to care about my black players not just when they're on the field i want you to care about them when they're off the field and mike you know mike Krzyzewski, you know, coach k you know posted a great video you know saying listen basically saying the same thing so if you guys haven't haven't seen it check it out i'm sure it's on the duke Duke um, University Athletics website. I'm sure it's probably on YouTube as well. So it's also, I, mean, I think uh, uh, Matt Ryan has said that he's going to, well, is, is speaking up too. So it's, it's also good to see like Caucasian players and coaches sort of step up and say, look, these are my teammates. You know, these guys are also my friends and, you know, these are my players. So I need you guys to care about them. Not, not just as they have the pads on and they're playing, but also when their pads are off and they're walking on, walking on the streets. Yeah. I mean, and there's also the beauty of now of camera phones, of being yeah. able to catch, mm -hmm. to capture these these moments that are are so uh, just disgusting. I mean, obviously the murders, are, you know, the murdering of George Floyd, mur like it's good that we're able to capture these things on film, but even just the stupid, awful microaggressions that you guys have to deal with every single day from from all of the Karens and Chads out there, you know, you guys should not ever have to. So at least we can use cameras to make sure that people understand, no, this bullshit is real and they have to deal with it every day. I, I wanted to ask you, Maggie, since we are uh, sticking with the social justice issue, of course, uh, the, what, made, what, what made news the last 24 hours as of this podcast is that the Washington Redskins, uh, of course, well, we call them the Washington football team on this show, the, uh, they are saying now, the news come out saying they, they're going to change their names, which I think you agree with us. They should have been done a long time ago. And, of course, uh, the president of FedEx, he also has a minority stake within the team. And, then of course, Pepsi Company, Nike, and FedEx as well uh, have a, an investment uh in that state of in within that team and they say they don't uh see what a uh, name change very soon they're going to pull out as we all know these united states are, is built on capitalism where whether we like it or not we all know that old famous saying money talks you know what walks so right. i want to get your thoughts on that do you think we'll see a, a name change not just with with uh the washington football team but i know that the chicago blackhawks the hockey team here uh there's been uh, some similar controversy, but not as much heat as the Washington football team. But I want to ask you about Washington. Do you think uh, when we will see their name change? I think that we're going to see it in the next couple of weeks. I think they are going to change it because they wouldn't put out a statement 
yeah. talking about their, their, that they're going to talk about changing it if they weren't serious about changing it. And if they come to the conclusion after all of this, after so much protesting and so, so everything that our Native American brothers and sisters have gone through to get them to understand that this is a racial slur and you need to stop using it, if they come to a conclusion in this moment that that name is still correct, it, it's, it's going to set off a firestorm. So hopefully, even though I know it's going to be just a bunch of rich old white men around a table, sitting around a table discussing it, hopefully reason will still prevail and they will change it. Um, yeah, with the Blackhawks thing, if, if you haven't read, you've, I'm assuming you guys have read Scott Powers' story on The Athletic yes. about yeah outstanding powerful article anybody listening to this please go look for it I'm pretty sure the athletic still has their uh, free trial going so you can you can do it even without subscribing but I think that the Blackhawks need to come up with a way of of making sure that they are reaching out to all of their fans and making sure that all of their fans are feeling welcome and that includes stuff like no fan should wear a headdress to a game Right. No fan should have their face painted like a stereotypical what we think of an Indian as. None of these things should happen. If, in, in, if that means changing the mascot, then it means changing the mascot. I'm not Native American, so it's like I, I don't feel like I can say, oh, I find that offensive to me. But if I hear one Native American say I'm not comfortable with that, then that's the end of it to me. Mm -hmm. they, then, it, then we don't need to have that mascot. You look at also, like Illinois too. I mean, they stopped doing the, uh, the you know, their chance. They got rid of their their mascot too. So, you know, change can happen. And I know, like North Dakota State, you know, they they got rid of their nickname. So, a lot of them are, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of changes happening. And if you guys saw, uh, you know, go to social justice, see keep with the social justice aspect of it. You should have seen if you saw Ian Desmond's uh, Instagram post. You know, he's not gonna play. He opted out of playing. He went into MLB and the lack of diversity and you know with everything else. I mean, he's a he's a mixed race and he went in you know, the Rockies outfield. He went in on the MLB. So, what do you guys think of Ian Desmond's comments? Well, I I, I thought it was very powerful and very brave of him to do. Um, he's not the only like Natasha Cloud is also from the WNBA who plays for the Washington Mystics. She's also sitting out this season because so that she can continue to work on racial justice issues. Uh, Maya Moore, who of course did all that work to help a, a wrongly incarcerated man get off of death row. Um, she, is not, she is missing this WNBA season too so that she can continue to work on racial justice. And it just, the bravery of these players to say, Hey, because I mean, they have a very short window of when they can play. They can't do this when they're 45, but it's still so important for them to work on this mo movement right now that they're giving up money and sponsorship and, and so and the ability to break records. And it, it really, it really is an incredible thing. I couldn't agree with you more, Megan, more athletes, uh, uh, being active, being socially aware, they sh it should be on their own uh, choosing, not pressure from the outside world, whether it be the agents, fans, and, and et cetera. But going back to Ian Desmond, he expressed his opinion. He was dead on. Excuse the expression of, of what he said in his Instagram post. Major League Baseball uh, needs to include more African Americans within their game, not just on the field, but off the field. I know they've been having their uh, RBI program to help kids from the little leagues trying to reach the major leagues. I know that it's been in existence for many years now, but I think they could do more. It's less than 6% of the uh, active uh, African-American players in their game. We only have two here in Chicago, and that's Jason Haywood uh, with the Cubs, and I'm blanking for my White Sox. Uh, Tim, Tim Anderson. Anderson. Tim Thank Anderson. You. <laughs> Tim Anderson. So we only have two, one on both sides of town. So uh, there's, there's a problem there. But I just think that all these pro leagues, we, we all know that the NBA is, is the most progressive league, whether we like it or not. But I think that all the other three uh, uh, leagues with MLB, NHL, uh, they can uh, uh, do more as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think part of the problem is, is you, don't see, you don't see young black kids playing baseball anymore. What do we need to do to change that? What do we need to do to make sure that they, can, they are comfortable playing basketball or football or baseball or hockey 
or lacrosse, whatever they want to play, a young black man or young black woman should feel like they can. And so I, I think part of it is needs to be whatever sort of whatever sort of outreach is happening in, say, Glen Ellen needs to also be happening in Englewood. Whatever sort of support that is happening to players in the suburbs also needs to be happening for young black kids in the city. So if we if we can if if MLB really cares about this issue and God knows they should, then they need to be looking at not just who not just who is on their teams now, but how are they making sure that a, the pipeline is filled. But Curtis Greyer says somewhere in there, you know, he's a name that a lot of young people know, and you know, he's from Chicago, so. He has stadium over UIC named after him. Of course, he played there. So I think that would be a start, putting him in this capacity to try to sort of like an outreach to the, the, these urban cities to get more black black players to play baseball, perhaps to be considered baseball. You know, and some of the, and some of the other sports try to find athletes that people know that maybe to reach out to some of these players, these would be athletes in some of these bigger cities. So I think, I think that's the key. Yeah, and like, like I think it's going to be really exciting watching Ed Howard, you know, a Southsider, a Mount yeah. Carmel grad, see him play for the Cubs and see him, you know, get to, like, he, he will have a hometown crowd built in every single game. So, like, I, I think making sure that the Cubs do their best of, of putting him out there, you know, that's going to be a big part of it, too. Maggie Hendricks, friend of the show, veteran sports writer and talk show host, joining us here on Sega City Sports Zoom style, along with Lakina McGee, I am Sydney Brown. Just a couple more minutes with you, Maggie, before we, we let you go. Uh, since we haven't had any sports over the last three to four months, what have you been doing to keep yourself entertained? <laughs> well, I'm very crafty. I like crafting. So yeah. I've been okay. sewing and making like wreaths out of out of paper flowers <laughs> and cross stitching and doing do I've I've made a lot of crap so <laughs> I'm gonna, it's been nice to have the time to do that so I'm gonna keep keep and I'm gonna keep doing it because it it helps me uh, work the other side of my brain. Oh, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Oh yeah, listen, we've seen people say you know they've been doing a lot of arts and crafts and you know ba- I've been doing a lot of baking. I just made some brownies yesterday, so. They, I was baking a fair amount until it started to get warm, and now I haven't been baking as much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to ask you, Maggie. I, I follow you on Instagram as well, and, and I, I, I've, I've been hearing you. Um, I've heard you, of course, in the past so on 670 The Score, whether you've been a guest or you're, the show you used to have with Julie DeCaro, that you, you, had, you're in, you were in love with baking. Where did that passion for baking uh, and cooking uh, uh, came from? Where did it come from? A, a little of it's from my grandma, my uh, my dearly departed grandma Flo. Um, she was a hell of a baker and made some really great things. But also, it's just it's just I like getting to play with ingredients and play with things, and and then all of a sudden it comes out and it's delicious, or it comes out and it's terrible, and I learn from it. You know, you get both yeah. of things of it. So I love yeah, I love it. I love baking. Could be a little yeah. side business. Could be a little side business. Just saying, Maggie. It's always, you know, maybe it's always, uh, always up here. And maybe I will. <laughs> yeah. We would like to try sometime when all this is over, Maggie, not, not to be a freeloader or anything, but right. we'd like to try some of your recipes sometime. I, I usually, I usually do my, uh, make sure my guest spots have some cookies that accompany me. So I could do that. Awesome. Awesome. You heard yeah. me, Lukina. We're ready. Oh yeah, of course. Of course. Always. <laughs> always. Um, okay, okay, well, let, let's, let's talk about DePaul for a second. Um, you think about Jean Linty Ponsetto, she's retiring. I mean, look, I mean, Doug Bruno has done great things, that women's basketball program, um, the soccer, the women's soccer team has done very well. Some of their, the non the, the Olympic sports people have done very well, but the men's basketball team is sort of like the bread and butter. So who do you think could probably, you know, the new AD will probably bring it? I know the, the president has been, has been there a couple of years. He's been trying to maybe perhaps he finally now has the opportunity to hire a new AD. So what do you think DePaul has to do to sort of get some of those, especially, you know, speaking of keeping athletes in Chicago, yeah. getting those top basketball recruits to stay in Chicago? Well, I think it's going to be a tough situation for the AD because they just gave Dave Lato an, an extension. So, yeah. like, when you mm-hmm. – the the AD is going to have to come in and 
de continue to deal and not be able to hire a new basketball coach. So I don't know. I would not, I would not want the job at DePaul myself because there's just so many high expectations, but not necessarily the same kind of involvement and funding and fundraising as a school, say like Georgetown or Vander or v Villanova. Like those are also, those schools are also, you know, urban Catholic schools with big basketball traditions. But DePaul mm -hmm. has fallen so behind that they don't have that same kind of backing. So I, I, I would not want that job. It, it is a very tough mountain to climb. All right, Lakina, anything else from you? Uh, no, that's, 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 that's all I've got. Yeah, what a fun field. Two, is, two hours that quick. we just had with our good friend Maggie Hendricks, a veteran sports writer and talk show host, formerly of 670 in the score. Maggie, where can people find you again on social media? At Maggie Hendricks, both on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me there. Yeah, we have a new time. nickname for you, Maggie. It's Auntie Maggie, as you know to us on the show. Thank you so <laughs> much for being a friend of the show. Uh, we're going to give you a, a big big virtual hug. Thank you for spending some Group time hug. with us today on this holiday <laughs> weekend. Uh, uh, thanks again for being a friend of the show. And thanks for your support as well uh, for the Dean David Shaw. Uh, for those of you that missed today, just filled in for Les Grobstein uh, uh, yeah. later this week on 6 a.m. in school. You can check out the podcast later. Follow them on all social media platforms. Maggie, thanks again uh, for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. You're a delight. You're, uh, you've been a pleasure to talk to. And good luck with everything. We'll be talking again to you soon, okay? All right. Thank you so much, guys. This was a blast. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Maggie. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye. Right, be safe. Right, take care. All right. Oh, that was a lot of fun. That went by quick, yes. Sid. Yes. Uh, it's the old saying goes, time flies when you're having fun. And this is what we do every week on this program. Exactly. A um, couple of things that, you know, we want to get to. Do you have anything else you want to talk about, Sid, before we wrap? We got a few more minutes. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Lakina. <laughs> I want to wrap this thing up and go do some barbecue, even though we can't really go anywhere because right. <laughs> everything is shut down here in Chicago. Right. So I, I did go real quick. I did go to the store. Uh, went to, I did uh, go to the store. Excuse my broken English, but I think I said it correctly. I, yeah. <laughs> I did uh, go to the grocery store earlier today, and it was crowded because of Fourth of July weekend. And I did get what I needed to get, but uh, the store that I go to um, for uh, until the last couple of weeks, uh, the 10 items or less aisle was closed, of course, due to social distancing and things along that line. Right. It's been open the last couple of weeks. And when I tell you, when I tell you there was a long line, it was a long line, but it was moving. So uh, I, I, I went earlier in the morning. So I said, I'm going to beat the crowds and all that. When I got there, it was <laughs> it was crowded. It, it was crowded, <laughs> but you know people were moving. But uh, I, I was like, I, I thought I was early. I thought eight thirty <laughs> nine o'clock. Well, it's early for me, especially because of my nine to five schedule. But uh, when I saw all those other people in there, I was like, I guess I'm not the I'm not the one that's early. But I, <laughs> I, I did purchase what I had to purchase, and I got out of there in one piece. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, well, well, yeah, but uh, listen, I'm sure a lot of folks are off today. We're doing this on, we're, we're uh, recording this on July 3rd, right before mm -hmm. the holiday. So I'm sure, listen, a lot of things are closed today. A lot of people are taking the day off, you know, making it a full three-day weekend. So I'm not surprised, but I'm glad you got what you needed. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and once I say, and say, listen, I actually got like a lot of my stuff like already, you know, we have like took advantage of some sales. So I'm going to go ahead and maybe fire up some, some baby back ribs, you know, eat some maybe some mac and cheese and maybe a nice coleslaw so that's that's our that's my dinner we keep it very small especially since we're not gonna, not gonna be able to have a lot of stuff anyway all the fireworks exactly. shows are canceled in the city so i think i like a lot of a lot of parts of the suburbs too so there's really nothing to do yeah <laughs> it's gonna yeah. be hot too so you're not gonna want to want to go outside you know anyway and i think uh, uh the one quick thing before we uh call it a a, a day for this week's podcast I uh, will be enjoying some air conditioning tomorrow since I don't have to go anywhere. Oh, well, that's been the case outside of my nine to five. I, uh, I'm going to cook my stuff, I think, early in the morning to before noon, cook it, and then wrap it up for later, eat smaller amounts here and there, but I'm going to enjoy some air conditioning Very finally. Good. It works, but I don't use it a lot, so 
I'm gonna enjoy the hell out of that thing tomorrow. Oh, yeah. oh look, it's good. Listen, it's gonna be hot the next several days. So yes. welcome to summer in yes. Chicago. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's nothing going on. Yeah, I'm about to say yeah. There's a, yeah, that makes it even more depressing. It says yeah, we can't go right. anywhere. But uh, listen, real quick before we wrap, um, a six eleven uh, center may maybe doing some maybe a game changer for college hoops. Uh, McCour McCour Maker is like you know. To go to Howard University, he's a top recruit um, from D.C. He actually is going to stay home and go to Howard. He was considering Memphis, UCLA, and Kentucky. Now, a lot of people are saying that maybe that could be this could be like the the game changer for HBCUs. What do you think? Hopefully, it is because we all know that those those uh, historic black colleges and universities they are part of the NCAA, but they're not because. Uh, they're not on the same playing field as a Duke or North Carolina or Texas or Michigan or UCLA to a lesser extent. So this could be a game changer if more top 10, top 15 recruits uh, like this young man uh, consider those t- types of schools. It could be game changer uh, uh, if they bypass those big, big colleges that go to those mid-major or smaller schools. We all know that in, in scouting, especially when it comes to basketball, talent uh, – uh, uh, talent is everywhere, but the right scouts will find you in, no matter wherever you play. Look at Hall of Famer Joe Dumars that comes to mind. He came from McNeese, de- many states. And so he, he's a two-time champion with the Pistons as a player. Of course, a, a world champion as a general manager of the 4 team. So wherever you find talent, uh, it doesn't matter. The right scouts come and find you. They will find you. So we've seen that throughout the years in basketball. Of course, uh, uh, the HBCUs and now with football real quick before the black athletes were allowing these big mainstream universities. They came from H- HBCUs. Jackie Slayer, the now late Jackie Slayer, the uh, late Walter Payton, they went to HBCUs. So uh, th- there's some value there when you, when you have the talent there. So hopefully it could be a, a game changer. More type athletes will fall to go to those um, those schools. And I, I will add, go to these schools because you want to. Don't go because yeah. you feel like you have to or you have to, you know, you want to be sort of like the trendsetter or you want to be the woke, you know, the woke spokesperson. <laughs> I mean, listen, I mean, I, I'm saying, though, I mean, like, I want this. Is, these are some great schools, but, you know, and they mm-hmm. are, and, you know, in ESPN, they're showing their games and whatnot, but there's a reason why North Carolina a t is leaving the MEAC. There's a reason why Hampton left the MEAC. Mm-hmm. So let, let's, you know, so I would say, like, go to these schools because you want to. Don't feel like you're Pressure, being pressured from your family members or your friends is sort of like, hey, go to HBCU school instead of these schools. They don't care about you. Let mm-hmm. the, do it because you want to. Yeah. And also, too, pay attention to this trend as well because we all know that for the next collective party or agreement for the NBA, they're going to get rid of this one and done rule and only select a few spots for the G League, but not all your athletes are going to these colleges either. They're going to bypass college. There's only a certain amount of spots for the G League, but those players that are eligible for it, they're going to uh, play for the G League for, for one year in the, in, to see if they can map it up for the next career in the NBA. Too. So pay attention to those two trends as well. And I, will also, and I will also say, too, that maybe give them a chance to maybe go back to college in case it doesn't work out with yeah, the GL. Yeah. And mm-hmm. also maybe, you know, if they don't get drafted, let's, you know, let's have them have a plan B as well. Just – you know, mm-hmm. just saying. you follow me at, on that note. You follow at me at the key, at Keena McGee on Twitter at Keena underscore me on the Insta. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at CK80. Once again, it's at CK80, S-I-D-K-I-D-80, S-I-D-K-I-D-80. And you can read all of my articles at wearegalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L radio.com. And you can follow the Dean Davis Show, which is the crew that I'm a part of as well. On all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Dean Davis Show. Once again, at Dean Davis Show. Great job by Ken and Damon, or Ken and D, I should say. Uh, they filled it for Les Grobstein uh, this past Thursday into Friday morning on the score. I'm sure the podcast is up uh, right now. Hopefully that is by the time this our episode is released to the public. And you can listen to Dean Davis, the sports show, and Dean Davis, the flip. As long, along with this program as well, on uh, War on Anchor, which kicks you over to Spotify and wherever you uh, podcast, we wherever you download your podcast. Once again, it's Dean Davis to Flip and Dean Davis to Sports Show. All right, so enjoy your Fourth of July weekend, everybody. You know, stay cool out there, stay safe, and be good to each other. Don't, listen, don't don't mess around with the fireworks, please. 
Yes, especially here here in Illinois, it is illegal. Leave them alone. Exactly. So for St. Island Keenan, enjoy your holiday weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week here on Second City Sports Zoom style. Happy birthday, America. Holla. <laughs>